All right, got the room tone, room tonic, rather later than I expected, but here we are. Let's get in. She in the light? Not she in the light. Light is a little crazy right now. Light is a little crazy. It's a little finicky, you know? Oh, look at this. Wet? It's not wet. It's wet. She's drip, drip, drop. April shower. April shower. Oh, oh, hi. I am not a homosexual. I never have been, and I like lima beans. That was a lie. <laughs> If culture studies was simply about the distortions which the media make of a meaning whose truth we could somehow find independently of the media, it would be a very different kind of study from what it is in fact. I grew up watching a lot of trash TV. This was in the 90s. The beginning of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the end of Welfare as We Know It, and a carousel of racist police violence. So while I had no idea that the military required you to keep your queerness a secret, queer secrets were revealed all day on television. I hadn't even hit puberty yet, and I thought I knew which adult-sized bones could tell a woman from a man in a dress. Despite living in public housing, I hadn't heard the phrases deadbeat dad or welfare queen until well into high school. Or however, you are not the father. Yeah! More times than I can count. And as a child, the Rodney King incident was hidden from me. Judge Judy was adversarial enough. A moron! And you still don't even get it! So before I even knew what a marginalized population was, or that I was part of one, or who was doing the marginalizing, tabloid TV put them front and center and told me that it was all true. The transvestites are out to trick you. And these unfit mothers have simply raw-dogged so many deadbeat acrobats. The only way to find the fathers was gene sequencing. And of course, this embarrassing truth-telling is the entire premise of the judge show. Dismissed. And it's called Trash TV, so I don't think it's meant for the silent, discerning taste of the museum. Oil magnets don't dispense their wills on people's court. These shouting matches, wig snatches, and undisciplined defendants are all broadcast to the same masses they ridicule. Masses which are both actor and audience, masses complicit in this ridicule, and masses which included a very young, very confused, and very frustrated me. And now, some 30 years into my life and fully situated in the margins of being broke, black, and queer, I want to unravel this decades-long mystery and talk about judgment. How legal, social, and aesthetic judgment play out on the judge show, and specifically, how I went from hating this What's a man need jewelry for? to loving this. You know what, it's given very much of how you doing your honor, Miss Judge Lance Toler. Iconic. You're watching the first ever document of me making my way through the maze that is visual culture. And in this first video, we'll talk about Stuart Hall's encoding and decoding in the television discourse to help us navigate how reality is more a produced effect in these shows and not simply something being neutrally captured by the cameras. Trying to find out how the meanings enter into the event themselves, how they help to constitute the event. The second video will focus more specifically on the judge show's development and will borrow lightly from Michelle Foucault to explore how authority and spectacle maintain certain ideas about race and class in the judge show. You are an example of why people should have to take tests before they're allowed to have children. And finally, and most satisfyingly, we'll watch how those same tools undermine the entire premise of the judge show. How Rolling Ray's unrepentant taste makes a mockery of the show itself. Look at her wig! Her eyebrows, her makeup! This will borrow heavily from Susan Sontag's equally iconic notes on camp. But before we bear witness to this delicious, defiant resistance, we gotta talk about these kids. This baby, this baby got no ounce of Puerto Rican in it. This baby is Mexican as hell. No, the mouth, the hell for booty lip. The booty lip tells it all. The booty lip? The booty lip. Look at it, the split in the middle. My tablet TV connoisseurship began on days home from school under the watchful eye of my grandmother, who controlled the remote. For a while before this, there were two kinds of TV. There was cartoons, fantasies, sitcoms, the fake stuff, and there was the news, which was whack. It was also real. But at some point, watching these women get berated by their potential baby fathers and the spectacle of people's phobias, some philosophical issues started twinging in my young brain. Politically, they were like being mean. The shows weren't nice to people. You're a moron. You are a moron. Ethically, they were always doing too much. Fuck you, my mama, you a hoe. And ontologically, I couldn't tell the shit was dead ass or not. Like, would you really go on TV and do this? Like, well, this is kind of embarrassing. I said, Corey, a hand just came out of my vagina. Naturally, my grandmother was not interested in answering all these questions. But she also told me that prior to her daytime TV fame, Judge Judy had convicted my uncle of some juvenile crime in like the 80s. This didn't help. It only made it worse because it was now a real thing. I must have made a stink face or something because she tried to soothe me by telling me it was just entertainment. And I was like, the fuck? That does not help with my feelings about how this is now a personal thing for our family. I mean, I know she wasn't trying to get into it, but what would she try to do with tell me it was just entertainment? Excuse her own enjoyment of the show? Keep me from getting worked up about something that was so insignificant as television? How does that work? And we'll address this by way of a more appropriate genre, the children's western.
the business I used to be in. <laughs> That's how you found out who was the hero and who was the villain in the first reel. <laughs> the good guys wore the white hats. <laughs> Take the simple structure, early and now children's TV western, modeled on the early Hollywood B-feature genre western. With its clear-cut, good, bad, Manichaean moral universe, it's clear social and moral designation of villain and hero, the clarity of its narrative line and development, its iconographical features, its clearly registered climax in the violent shootout, chase, personal showdown, street or barroom duel, for long, on both British and American TV, this form constituted the predominant drama entertainment genre. Encoding, decoding in the television discourse by the late, the great, the sometimes cantankerous icon, Stuart Hall. From the house of Hall! is a seminal text in media studies, primarily concerned with the ways that audiences understand and derive pleasure from television. Hall's essay does this via the children's western and the propensity of the genre to reproduce violence in those same children, and we'll be looking at tablet television, the audiences who call in for free studio tickets, the audiences at home, and the audiences who call in to become guests and divulge their tea on stage. You must be 18 or older to call. And how, taken together, all three of these groups seem to be participating in a certain mockery of the guests. The basic idea is that television is a kind of communication. In this process, producers draw meaning from the frameworks of knowledge that are shared by themselves and the audience members. What do you think life's all about? Encode that meaning onto some medium, that is, television. Produce the message that is a television program, which is then decoded by the audience members. Boy, what a great show. And those decodings enter back into those frameworks of knowledge. Wait till the kids back home hear about this. This may seem a bit over-intellectualized with something as simplistic as speech, arguably a complicated process on its own, but highlighting the encoding process really emphasizes how much effort is put into creating a clear storyline in something as complex and with so many moving parts as broadcast television. The production of meaning means that there is a kind of symbolic work, an activity, a practice which has to go on in giving meaning to things and in communicating that meaning to someone else. So along with the tropes in the opening quote describing the tools used to create a clear moral universe in the children's western, Hall's essay zeroes in on a specific example to clarify. The hero knows how to draw his gun faster and shoot better than his enemy. When confronted by the villain, he shoots him dead with a single shot and then provides a decoding. To be a certain kind of man, a hero, means the ability to master all contingencies by the demonstration of a practiced and professional Cool. Armed with that example, we can take a shot at the judge show and see what they're trying to tell us. Oh, she's firm. I don't have a hearing problem. This ear works good. This one works even better. She's firm. I'm not responsible for their ticket, and I'm not going to pay for it. Who says you're not going to pay for it? I make that decision, not you. She's honest. What do you have to say? Oh, I have to Nothing. Say. I was raised in the streets, arrested several times as a kid, but I didn't give up. I went from jail to judge in 15 years, and that's when I began giving back through public service. What's a man need jewelry for? What's on your finger? Yeah. A hey, wedding ring, it means oh, I, I have a wife. So you can't even stand up straight, you want so if the all caps Roman serif typeface words fair, firm, and honest happen to pass you by, it's clear that these programs are trying to associate the judges with a certain authority, morality, and a very special flavor of reason. Oh, if the producers fail to coach you on proper posture and accessories for a leisurely afternoon in small claims, Judge Joe Brown will aggressively correct you. And Judge Maybelline seems to take a particular pleasure in flaunting her authority when she asks what witness what he has to say before immediately telling him that he has nothing to say. And aside from Judge Joe Brown's comedy of manners or the sadism of Maybelline and Ephraim, all these clips have a certain real, down-home, common-sense rhetoric about them. There's no habeas corpus here, none of the obscure Latinate phrasing of prestige legal drama. This is a people's justice, people just like you, one of whom was raised in the streets and who notably went from jail to judge in just 15 years. And how can we be concerned with the prison industrial complex or the biases of the court system when all we need to reach a fair judgment is to know that at least one of Maybelline's ears hears good. I don't want to OZ and devote too much intellectual attention to these 30 seconds and introductory segments, but when you think about it, would we have concluded that Maybelline was so fair, firm, and honest they hadn't forced it upon us in the opening? And I'm pretty sure that all these court cases would have proceeded just fine without reminding us of the transformative power of incarceration. Arrested several times as a kid. Also kind of strange that we're mentioning jail so much when these shows are mostly small claims arbitration, and so criminal consequences are very, very unlikely. Almost like these shows are using the law as a way to discipline the urban poor. I know people can change. But that's probably saying too much, or at least rehabilitate them with wedding rings. It means I and that's that on that. It should be clear that Hall's model is useful for us in deciphering the messages that come through television. And for Hall, he hopes that this model will reorient mass media research away from what he calls simplistic, low-flying behaviorism. 
Though we know the television program is not a behavioral input, like a tap on the kneecap, it seems to have been almost impossible for researchers to conceptualize the communicative process without lapsing back into one or other variant of low-flying behaviorism. So with that basic example out of the way, we can take a closer look at some of the more complex concepts introduced by the essay. And I want to focus on three. One, that communication is not a static event where producers deliver their meaning straight to the dome, unambiguously to a passive, receptive audience just waiting to be instructed. You like the killings, huh? What do you think life's all about? But it's an active process wherein both the audiences and the producers make sense of the television message in their larger cultural context. Two, that any meaning intended to be communicated is dependent upon and affected by the encoding process. Shh, back at you. Why they acting already? It ain't nothing to preview. And at every step in this process, the intended meaning can operate differently. Leading Hall to describe this as a process of systematically distorted communication. And three, that those distortions which adhere to the communication process enable different decodings of the television message. I don't know why y'all is acting like this! And so audience members misunderstanding or misreading things aren't really misreading or doing anything incorrect, more like bringing their own information to the television program when they're decoding it. My girlfriend already seen the movie, she said they don't need to stay together in the end! And at the end of the essay, Hall provides a schema for these types of decoding. So we'll look at each of these issues in turn, starting with the things outside the television program which condition how meaning can even happen in the first place. Up the phone, girl! Good God Almighty, you make me miss my show, it's gonna be some trouble! Uh. Ryan, thanks for joining the Tricky Lake Show. Yeah, Today's topic is, phone, and ladies, girl. you're gonna love this, ain't doing no good dads and their baby's mom. Oh. Approaches consist of the maps of meaning, the things which allow us to make sense of a world. Following the work of other media theorists, Hall's essay wants to explore the entirety of the mass communications process, wherein the audience is both the producer and the receiver of the television message. And this process necessarily begins with things that are outside of the television message itself, things like structures of production. The third season, The Jerry Springer Show was like nothing else on daytime TV. Is this daytime TV, or primetime TV, or late night, and the different kind of shows and messages you can receive in those contexts, to the technical infrastructure. Now, I suppose you all know how ordinary television works. So is this going to be a cable subscription that's personal to you, or a program that's run over the airwaves through advertising, or something like YouTube? And three, what he calls frameworks of knowledge. Meaning arises because of the shared conceptual maps which groups or members of a culture or society share together. And that third one, the frameworks of knowledge which make meaning possible, is what I want to focus on today in regards to tabloid television, which is daytime TV syndicated in the mid to late 90s. And for one framework of knowledge, we can look to welfare reform. By the mid 1990s, a drumbeat of media attention had convinced many Americans that people on welfare were either cheats or loafers. In the essay, Widow to Welfare Queens, the author describes the process whereby the image of the welfare recipient went from a grieving widow in need of help to a certain brand undeserving, mostly black woman, the welfare queen. In the 1960s, aid to families with dependent children shifted from a program serving primarily white widows and supporting them in their work as mothers to a punitive program, aiding a disproportionate number of women of color who were divorced, deserted, or never married. A narrative of race, sexual deviance, fraud, family breakup, and community disintegration came to dominate discussions of welfare and black poverty. Conservative pundit Bill Bennett describes his issue with welfare reform as one not solely about jobs, but also about the increased rate of illegitimate children born in the United States. The major problem with welfare is not that people aren't working. That is a problem. But the major problem uh, is the increase in illegitimacy in this country. Uh, the major problem with welfare is that lots of women, young women particularly, continue to have lots of babies out of wedlock. And we can see Newt Gingrich describe his feelings about welfare reform in the following clip. They create a culture of poverty and a culture of violence which is destructive of this civilization. So when describing the effects of the previous welfare system, Newt Gingrich's rhetoric is anti-poor, nationalist, and nearly racial, right? It's a clash of cultures, one of whom threatens civilization. Now we could sit here and go through the manual work of Deconia's message, and we probably will. Most of that work is being done for us on tablet television. You are not the father. You are not. What? 
So to drive the point home, institutionally speaking, in 1996, welfare reform passes and the assistance provided to needy families became temporary, or TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. And the cultural rhetoric around this change had a distinctly negative outlook on recipients of welfare. Either cheats or loafers. This issue concerned all well-behaved citizens who had their hard-earned tax dollars swindled from them by the sexually and fiscally irresponsible. Why should we have to pay for you to sit at home Watch your soap operas. And there was a great concern over whether or not these families were as needy as they said they were to receive their temporary assistance. People on welfare make more money than people that are working. Amidst the confusion of this drama of who deserved what resources from which people for how long, we receive our deus ex machina in the form of a paternity test. Did you have a DNA test with that child? Pay child support for that child. You, you, and you're you gonna pay child support for this one too? To curb soaring out of wedlock births, they proposed cutting off welfare to unwed mothers who continued to have children. In a frenzy to purge the welfare rolls, we get a blossoming of these paternity test segments. One could easily imagine this same technology being used in segments that exonerate the wrongfully accused, or maybe even adopted children who were in search of their biological parents. But no, what we got was a transformation of a social responsibility into the ecstasy of individual error. And once the errant fathers are found, only his wages will be garnished, leaving your hard-earned tax money to be used for something more amenable. Like another war. It's not to say that Moray is somehow solely responsible for the passing of welfare reform or the image of the welfare queen. Far from that. I don't have access to the boardrooms or the contracts or who's planning the show at all. As I mentioned before, welfare reform passed in 1986 and his first paternity test episode aired in 1998 could just be a temporal coincidence. But it is to say that the cultural rhetoric around welfare reform and the unwed, unchaste, and undeserving mothers laid fertile ground for us to develop this carnivalesque display of heredity. And if we look to Montel Williams in one of his paternity test segments, he articulates his reasoning in the following way. What I am going to hand over to you is admissible in a court of law, okay? To the father. It really has nothing to do with whether or not someone lets you see the child or not, or whether you have difficulty in your visitation. You are a father. And I don't care if you never see your child again for the next 18 years. I hope that the court takes money out of your check every day so we don't have to pay for your child. So I'm not just making this shit up. You owe $27,500 in back child support. <laughs> appeared to be inebriated and for some reason uh, started pouring the contents of a bottle all over your floor. You ask him what he was doing, he became angry and said, it's for my dead homies. <laughs> If there's anything to be learned from televised courtroom trials, both in reality and elsewhere, it's that order in the court is sacrosanct. Pay attention, son. Look at me when I'm talking to you. So, if you were to find yourself with the grave misfortune of arguing the validity of commemorative moisturizers against the pre-Parkinson's vocals of the Honorable Foghorn Leghorn, I'm sorry, I thought you was corn. There would be no snickering, giggling audience. But this isn't reality. This is tablet television. You no, know, I had on booty shorts and everything. So he was like, ooh, you thick. <laughs> and that brings us to encoding. Before any meaning, that is the tension of a lie detected or the quantum state of your baby father, before any of these things can be communicated, they have to be encoded onto some medium. And this encoding has significant effect upon what it can mean, what uses it has, what gratifications it provides, and what pleasures it satisfies. And each medium has its own conventions. Says Hall of the Children's Western, it means that a set of extremely tightly coded rules exist whereby stories of a certain recognizable type, content, and structure can be easily encoded within the Western form. And our medium is tabloid television, with its characteristic spectacle and its heavy dependency on a certain kind of realism. The true sex of the body and the dress, the unimpeachable biology of the paternity test, and of course, the same truth and reality is what motivates these judges' decisions. And in this section, we'll be looking at how tablet television encodes reality into both its structure and its content, how that encoding affects what the shows mean, and how the genre's unbelievable spectacles can sometimes undermine that same raw, unscripted realism on which our emotional reactions so desperately depend. And we'll do that first by looking at American democracy. Own, as you may recall, was the undecided voter in the red sweater who asked the energy question at last night's debate. Take, for example, the American 
American Town Hall, where a crowd of citizens voice their opinions, air their grievances, and ask questions to a panel of politicians. If you were around in 2016, you may remember the Donald Trump Hillary Clinton debates that featured a town hall at the end of it, wherein one mustachioed, scarlet sweater clad Ken Bone, positively brimming with untapped erotic force, made his debut. Why do we all find him so charming? Is it the red sweater? Maybe it's the mustache? He found himself at the center of his own tabloid scandal when, during a Reddit AMA, he made some generally unsavory statements about the Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman situation. But that's not the only place where the town halls and tabloids intersect. You're fired, get out of here. In the essay Electronic Carnival's spectacularizing talk, the authors describe how tablet television has a way of taking on structures and conventions from multiple different genres to produce this sort of excessive display of human emotion. More than any other televised programs, perhaps, talk shows have revealed since their inception an incredibly voracious capacity to borrow from and incorporate a wide range of entertainment genres. They also try to recreate the democratic atmosphere of town hall gatherings. Yet they appeal to the entertaining qualities of the circus exhibit or the grotesque or the odd. A little over a year ago, I had the worst stomach ache of my life. I figured it was just the corn dogs I had for lunch. But when I went to the bathroom to relieve myself, a hand came out of my vagina. I was so stunned. And that this talk show format has been hailed as the last bastion of free speech, where the voices of the unheard are being actively promoted. Celebratory comments about the democratic spirit of talk shows consider them the last bastion of free speech, where the voices of the ordinary, powerless, and underrepresented citizens can still be heard. Phil Donahue is largely credited with popularizing this format in his daytime talk shows, and in his show dealt with issues that were facing Americans of the day. In this clip, you'll see a group of biracial, mixed-race people who, to varying degrees, pass for white, talk about their experiences and answer questions from the audience. I wish I could live my life without hurting my family, but that is not possible, and I'm not going to pass. I'm an adult. I have a right not to have to pass. Because of this political structure that exists already within the American consciousness, it was not difficult at all for Phil's show to take on this format in a TV program. This elderly white woman came up to us and she began to scream at my mother. She doesn't need to sit with you niggas. And as media consumers, you all should have no difficulty seeing the same format used in the following clips. And now, today's show revolves around one simple question. You think you can tell a man from a woman? We have 13 beautiful women on our show today. Only the catch is that some of them are actually men. Man or woman, who is that? A man. That's a man? Yeah. How do you know? I don't know, it just looks kind of... What, what, how do you know? Because... Because I think, what? I think, her, I think her face is kind of the too perfect. Chiseled? Too yeah. perfect? Yeah. So it has to be a man? Yeah. A woman can't have a perfect face? It just looks like... Presumably, Maury invites all the audience members in the studio, and by extension, those of us at home... You all think you're so smart. ...to eagerly participate in this particular genital fantasy. The best part about being a woman is that I am voluptuous and deliciously luscious. It's in segments like these that I learned that trans people even existed. But when comparing it to Phil Donahue's program, uh, Should we call this a closet? Yeah. And when did you come out of the closet? It's not really doing the same kind of work, right? There's a guessing game they're playing, it's a spectacle, it's kind of joyous for the audience members. <laughs> It is not clear if they are trans people, if they are drag queens, or people who just cross-dress. But what we're seeing is people having their bodies interrogated visually to determine their real sex. How do you know? How do you know? Because... Because think, what? I... In terms of the general political context that trans people have to navigate in the mid to late 90s, healthcare, employment, safety, this very much is not the move. Today we're taking a look at the best fights, the sexiest guests, the best transsexuals. You'll definitely be able to recognize the same format used by another television host, former Cincinnati mayor, Jerry Springer. You said you want to get into business, but why don't you keep both the strippers? There's no business like whole business. What type of business? And so in that clip, the audience just lobs insults at people on stage. And they choose particular aspects of their personalities or their looks as fodder for the insult. My comments for Cletus in the back. The questions for the hillbilly in the green flannel. And when analyzing this in the context of electronic carnivals, this being the last bastion of free speech and hearing the voices of the unheard, I'm not sure it has the same gravity as a question you'd ask to a presidential candidate. Brown Brown boys. Boys. Stand back and stand by. But it is free speech. It should come as no surprise then that many talk show hosts advertise their shows through the very rhetoric of democracy and freedom of speech. Montel Williams, for instance, invites us to participate in his show with the idea of recovering what talk was meant to be. Appeals to the concept of citizenship and civic duty through his Speak Up America reminders. To conclude this section, it's clear that daytime talk shows employ a format reminiscent of a certain American political reality that actively encourages audience participation so that 
you at home can now go about your day with a newfound skill of gender speculation. Nice looking shoulders too, right? <laughs> But when comparing it to the American Town Hall format, it doesn't have the same relevance, significance, or general gravity as institutional politics. Although, considering our last president, who knows? Grab him by the pussy. The audience participation in these contexts is not geared towards having a deeper understanding of the diversity of the American fabric or some liberal phrasing like that. It's just making a spectacle of difference. It's definitely a man! Look at his muscles! They're bulging out! This sort of dialogue, the lighting, the setting, the host running into the stands to ask the audience questions. It's all toward audience engagement. Like and subscribe in the service, of course, of advertising. Belaboring the point, let us just restate the fact that the daily shows are among the cheapest programs to produce, yet the most lucrative source of profit for the media giants. And now that we've seen how tablet television encodes reality into its structure, we can take a look at some of the content-based consequences for this encoding practice. have now reached the conclusion of side one. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe.